fainting will get you killed, psychics don't work, attacking the blade is foolish, and attacking to the legs will expose your head, but you should train it anyway. Hello there, Martin here from Schildwach Potsdam. And in this video I want to talk about some, let's say, contested actions. And they are contested not only by modern practitioners of historical European martial arts, so sword fighting and all that uh, kind of stuff, but they were also contested by the actual historical fencing masters themselves. So the probably most prominent one is fainting. Why is fainting such a contested topic? A couple of masters say it's not part of the true art, for example, like a couple of fellow phrases it, or that it should be avoided and really just presents tempi, so um, moments to attack for your opponent. Well, these masters come from a perspective of fighting perfectly. And in general, if you're a perfect fighter, and if you're in a perfect fight and you can recognize everything perfectly, so right at the instant it happens, then every motion that is in measure, so in the distance where you could attack your opponent, which is not threatening you, presents a moment, so a tempo, to attack your opponent. So, for example, if they threaten or if they're just fainting a strike from right above, but then pulling it back to then strike from the left, this first motion here wasn't actually intended to harm you in any way. So, while they're coming forward with this motion, it presents, this motion presents a time frame for you to act and to strike them. So if you recognize a feint, you could always, really always, abuse it against your opponent. This especially counts for uh, feints that are done within measure, so within the measure where you can attack them directly or with like a short step, but also to a certain degree at the edge of measure, where every motion your opponent makes could be a temple for you to get in a more advantageous position to then thrust them, for example. Okay. So this is where fainting comes from. And why Capfell, for instance, says it's not part of the true art. Then again, he shows on the following plate several exercises where fainting actually is a thing. Why is that? Well, of course, we are not dealing with perfect individuals. We are not dealing with a perfect fight. And even if we could achieve perfection, okay, if we could achieve perfection, this still would need training. Okay? Because if, you're, if you don't have the trained eye, you wouldn't be able to recognize a feint and distinguish it from a real attack, okay? So to be a more perfect fighter, you would need to train for feints. You would need to have opponents that show you feints, that show you real attacks. So over time and with training, you should uh, be, able, be able to distinguish feint from real attack and act accordingly. Okay? And this really is the theme that goes through all of these things I've mentioned. For example, the next thing is uh, hitting to the legs. Why is hitting to the legs uh, suboptimal or not perfect? Well, because our maximum reach is always on shoulder height. So, the weapon is attached to our hand, and that hand is attached to our shoulder. Okay? So, our reach will always describe a circle around our shoulder joint. And while we can move this shoulder joint to a certain degree, if we're going like really low, then our reach shortens. 
Okay, and this shortened reach could be abused by a perfect opponent who just keeps the original measure, measure and goes for the perfect attack, which would be on shoulder height or at least closer to this line. All right, and you almost will have maximum reach. Okay, so once again, in a perfect fight where you could. Uh, where you are able to keep perfect measure and you are able to recognize an uh, attack that is actually made to your legs and could distinguish it from, uh, for example, an attack which is made to your chest, then you could just withdraw, for example, your leg, keep the measure and thrust or strike them while they are striking to the legs. Okay? But, then again, for this to, uh, <laughs> for this uh, thing to be possible, you would need to train, okay? And you would need to train, especially for strikes to the legs. Right, and the third thing was uh, striking to the blade, or beats, essentially, and that's just another motion, which is usually aimed to create a tempo by displacing the opponent's blade, to then gain an opening and strike the opponent and exit them thereafter. But of course, striking to the blade is inherently not dangerous to your opponent. All right? So if you just strike to the blade, Fabrice says, for example, you could go for a cavaciole, so a small disengagement around the incoming strike and thrust them, for example, on the other line. And that's a possibility if you are perfect, once again. So, you should train these. And, uh, as I said, we are not perfect individuals. We don't have perfect information, and we always need time to process all the information we can get. So, for example, even if you've trained, if you are trained really well in recognizing feints, beats to your blade and strikes to your leg and all this stuff, it still could be possible that you don't recognize it in time because you still have to react. So you're, if you're on the uh, reacting side, you are always like a couple of uh, milliseconds behind your opponent, then it could be still optimal for you to, for example, just step back and not take the optimal action, which would be like stepping back while counter-attacking, or disengaging and striking, or uh, in the case of the feint, just using that time for a direct strike into their tempo, while of course, hopefully covering the blade. Okay, so I hope this video is kind of useful to you. All these actions, they might be not part of the perfect fight, but if you don't train them, you can't be a perfect fighter. So definitely have a go at it. Until next time, remember to like, share and subscribe and take care. Ciao.